singing with uh, Jacob and Crystal this morning. Crystal, welcome back and thanks for helping us out today in leading worship. Uh, my name is Grace Lucas and I'm the lead pastor here at Bosqueville Methodist Church, but we have many ministers among us. And so I'm just am thankful for all that you are doing for friends and family and those who, uh, who you are caring for throughout uh, the community. We are all uh, priests and of uh, believers, right? So we are all ministering to one another. Today we are going to be continuing our series in uh, Revelation to the seven letters to the churches. And today we are going to be looking at the letter to Pergamum. And if I can ask for our, oh, I guess I'm supposed to be doing an announcement slides. I got it. Uh, our prayer group is meets on Wednesdays from 1 to 2 p.m. at the Activity Center. I invite you to join them. Uh, Shepherd's Heart, we have food packing actually three times in October because we do it every other week, and it just happens that we've got five uh, five or, or five Wednesdays in October. So we'll be doing the 3rd, the 17th, and the 31st from 10 to 11.30. It's a good time of laughter and fellowship and serving all at the same time. If you haven't had a chance to come out and do that with us yet, I would invite you uh, to do that. Our food distribution is on the second Saturday of the month. This month it's October the 14th. It's from 10 to 11, right next door at Bosqueville Baptist Church. It's something that the three churches are doing together, so blessing our community. We did have a good <clears throat> conversation with the principals of the middle school and the high school, and they're going to help us with some promotion and identification of families in need so that we can uh, make sure we're meeting the needs there with that food distribution. Got our prayer retreat coming up in, uh, in Oklahoma in November. I'm giving you lots of lead notice on that so you can uh, rearrange schedules and clear calendars to do what you need to do to attend with us. We can take a little caravan of folks up there. We've got three going so far. I haven't heard from anyone else yet, but uh, we would certainly love to uh, have a, a cohort from Bosqueville Methodist Church go up and learn and grow and pray together. So that would be that's something the Lord's laying in your heart. If you have questions about it, please seek me out. Our leadership uh, team will be meeting on, our leadership board meets on October 1st, immediately following the service. If you're on the leadership board, you know who you are, uh, please make sure you put that on your calendar. It'll probably be about an hour and a half a meeting just following the service on October the 1st. And for those of you who are interested in the Holy Land, uh, it's coming up March the 1st through the 10th. But you need to make your reservations by November 15th. And a few of you, I think I still owe an email to. I haven't forgotten. I'm going to get that information to you uh, this week. If you have any prayer requests or praises or updates, I ask that you would send those to Garland Duncan. And you all have been doing a great job of keeping, uh, keeping people informed about what's going on. And I uh, want you to remember uh, those as well, the disciple-making class that's going on at Bosqueville, uh, Greater Bosqueville Baptist Church and the Grief Seminar. Uh, I've heard really good things that have come out of that, uh, that Grief Seminar, and they only have had one session together. So if you can remember them on Tuesday nights, remember Sharon and Diane and those who are attending. You can remember them in prayer between 5.30 and 7, maybe while you're cooking your supper. Say a prayer for them or while you're walking your dog or whatever you're doing between 5.30 and 7. Because it's an important time of healing for uh, the grief that people have experienced. I was informed uh, by Rintia yesterday that uh, she lost her brother-in-law. We were asking for prayer for her sister. Uh, and he was uh, quite ill. And he was 89. He passed away. So just pray for her sister if you can remember her this week. All right. 
Garth, do you have anything that you have that you want to add to that? Garth, do you have anything that you'd like to add? No, ma'am. We'd like to have fair updates so we can keep that thing going as well. Yes, we love to see what God is doing. So updating the prayer requests helps us see how better we can pray, how we need to change our prayers as things change in someone's life. So please try to keep us informed. All right, as you are able, would you stand please for our prayer of invocation? And this comes from Revelation 19, verses 11 through 16. It says, I saw heaven standing open, and there before me was a white horse, whose rider is called Faithful and True. With justice he judges and wages war. His eyes are like blazing fire, and on his head are many crowns. He has a name written on him that no one knows but he himself. He's dressed in a robe dipped in blood, and his name is the Word of God. The armies of heaven were following him, riding on white horses, and dressed in fine linen, white and clean. Coming out of his mouth is a sharp sword with which to strike down the nations. He will rule them with an iron scepter. He treads the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has this name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. We thank you, Father, for this picture of Jesus, the faithful and true, one who judges with justice. We thank you for uh, the robe that he wears dipped in blood, the blood that saved us from our sins and gave us forgiveness. We thank you that his name is the Word of God. We worship you, Word of God. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords, and out of your mouth comes a sharp sword. We, we bow ourselves before you this morning because you alone deserve our worship. You alone are worthy of our worship. You alone are worthy of our praise. You alone are the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Be honored in our time here this morning. May we worship you and give you our whole heart as we sing, as we pray, and as we listen to your word. In Jesus' name, amen. Sing, sing the Lord, Lord. sing praises. 
Say out for all God's wonderful works. Glory to God, holy name. Let the hearts of those with you seek the Lord rejoice. Seek, seek the, the Lord, Lord and his strength. Seek, seek the Lord's presence continually. Remember <coughs> the wonderful works God has done, the miracles and the judgments God has uttered. O offspring of Abraham, God's servant, children of Jacob, God's chosen ones. The Lord is our God, whose judgments are in full all the earth. The Lord is mindful of his everlasting covenant, of the word commanded for a thousand generations. The covenant made with Abraham, his promise sworn to Isaac. To and confirmed <coughs> to Jacob as a statue, to Israel as an everlasting covenant, saying, To you, to you I will give the land of Canaan as you worship for your inheritance. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. <coughs>
So um, I had sent a little request out to those uh, families of those connected with um, the military, and they had sent me back some things that we can pray for, specific uh, for them. So let us go to prayer. Father, I uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity to come and to be in your presence today. We know that you are the one who is our refuge, our ever-present help in time of need. And so, Lord, those who serve in the military uh, need you and need your comfort and your presence and your guidance. I lift up those that they may be healthy, that they may be safe, as was requested by one of the, those who's serving. Father, I lift up the families um, of those who are left behind. Lord, you know how their hearts ache when they are apart from their loved ones. And so, Lord, I ask that you would just put a balm of Gilead upon their families and their loved ones as they're away and serving. That you would strengthen them. I thank you that you constantly keep them in their hearts. But I pray it would be in such a way that their hearts wouldn't break but that they would be comforted knowing that you are with them, that your presence goes before them. Lord, I pray specifically for uh, Jose Rodriguez, that you would uh, find a time where he can have approved leave to come home and be with his family. It is so difficult when in a moment's notice they're called to get back into the submarine and to on patrol. They're our first line of defense in many ways in this country. And so I ask that you would open a window of opportunity for him to apply for and receive leave to come home and be with his family. Lord, I lift up uh, Philip Banks to you and that he uh, is deployed in South Korea without his wife. So I pray that you would open up the opportunity for um, her to have permission to travel to be with him so they might, again, be family together. You know, their marriage is, is young. They haven't been married for even quite a year. So I pray, Lord, that you would uh, restore that family, bring them back together. I thank you for... Damian Carroll, and I thank you for John Bingley. And I pray that in each of the roles that they serve, one in the reserve and one in, in the army, that you would um, guide their hands, that you would lead them, that you would give them wisdom <coughs> and insight, that you would provide for their families abundantly, that as they have given and sacrificed to serve, that you would bless their families. And Lord, now I lift up all those who serve the military all over the world, and I ask for your hand on them. I ask for good leadership, for good officers, for good camaraderie. I pray that to, for those who are serving as chaplains, that they might strengthen that they might bring your word to those who have need, that they might instill courage where there is fear, boldness where there is timidity, and especially wisdom where there are questions. I thank you for hearing these prayers this morning, for caring about these men and women and their families and extended families so deeply. We ask especially for your blessing 
to fall on them, for your face to be turned towards them, for you to be near them and be present. I thank you now, Lord, for the gifts that have been given this morning and through the week to this place, to your church building, because your church is in your people, but to this building where we gather to worship, to give you glory, to elevate your word and your truth. We ask that you would multiply these gifts for your name's sake and for your glory for the ministry that goes forth from this place to bless the communities and the families all over Waco. And it's in Jesus' name that I ask. Amen. Amen. As you're able, would you stand with me for our doxology? Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise in all creatures here below. Praise him above all the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're in the middle, I think it's almost the middle, we're in number three out of seven today, we're in the middle of a sermon series on the letters that the Spirit, uh, that Jesus gave to the angel of each of the seven churches in the book of Revelation. And as we begin, we remember where these were located, they're in modern-day Turkey, and we've already talked about Ephesus, see there on the far left of the map, and Smyrna, as we talked about last week, and this week we're talking about Pergamum, the very top of the map. And then we have four left, and they just, I think, run right down until you end with Laodicea. So in week two, which was a letter to Ephesus, we talked about Jesus' authority over these seven angels, that he was the sending one of these angels. Angel basically means messenger or someone who's sent. And so Jesus had authority over these. He was holding them in his right hand. And he also was, his presence was among those seven lampstands. And that's important. That's very important that the presence of the Lord is among churches. Amen? Amen? Without the presence of the Lord, it says that Christ holds all things together. And so if, if Christ were to look away or Christ were not to think on us and pay attention to us, I think we would all just kind of dissolve into nothingness. That's how important the presence of Jesus is among us. They were commended because they persevered and that they wouldn't tolerate falsehood. We talked about that and that their concern that the that Jesus had with them was that they had lost love as their primary motivator. And so he cautioned them, hey, hey, wake up, consider how far you have fallen and repent. Do a 180, turn around from which way you're going. You're going down a love path. Turn yourselves around and return to Love being your primary motivator. Do the things that you did at first. We talked about Jesus as a lover, desiring to be a lover of our souls, and that that is the, the kit. The love relationship is what we have to keep day by day, kindling and rekindling, because it's so easy. Has anyone here ever built a fire? Anyone built a fire? So what happens when you stop adding logs to the fire. It goes down, right? So we have to keep rekindling, keep adding, keep adding logs to flame that fire of love for Jesus. And we do that through prayer, through study and, and 
love his word and through worship. And we, it's not just the worship we do here, but it's important. Remember how Eric reminded us that we need to be worshiping every day and all week long in order to be prepared to worship together. So there's some good radio channels out there that have Christian music on it that you can sing along with in your car. No one, when you sing along in your car, no one's going to know you can't carry a tune, right? So you can do that all day long, and you can you can engage your heart, engage your heart towards the Lord. That's what's so important. Love has to be at the center of all we do. I keep coming back to this because it's it is the most important thing. God is love, and our call is to love God and to love one another. That's our call. And the, Jesus says that sums up all of the law and the prophets in the whole Bible. To love God with your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's a lot of love. That's a lot of love. And to love your neighbor as yourself. And remembering, love is a verb. It's something we do. We talked about in 1 Corinthians 13, which I've been trying to memorize, by the way. And it's a challenge. And the next week, which was Last week, we talked about the letter to Smyrna, and we talked about the persecuted church, how they were afflicted, and they were persecuted, and they were poor, yet Jesus said they were rich, and we said they were rich because of their faith, and that faith is more precious than gold, and I reminded us that sometimes we get mixed up between the material world, which we seem to value really, really highly, and the spiritual world, which is going to last far longer than this material world, right? And we talked about gold not being so precious in heaven because they're using it to pave the streets with, right? So we have to rethink our value system. And uh, I was listening to a speaker this week who said, you well, know, this is the West. They're the only nations that, <clears throat> that think that the material world is more important than the spiritual world. He says, everywhere else in the world that you go or that I go to preach and to visit, Africa, India, Asia, they understand that the spiritual world is really strong. But I think there's a kind of hiddenness to the spiritual world that's part of the enemy's plan to say, if you don't know what's going on in the spiritual world, then you're not going to pay attention to it, so I'm just going to keep it hidden. Or make you make be made fun of if you talk about the spiritual world, right? There's something that keeps the understanding, the view, the realization of the spiritual world kind of under wraps in the West. So his concern for this persecuted church was that they would uh, they would not be afraid because suffering was coming. Suffering was coming, but he encouraged them that it was going to be short. Remember, only ten days. He said. 10 days. Suffering is going to be short. And he says, to those who, who hold on to me, even to the point of death, that they won't be hurt by the second death. We talked a little bit about what that meant at the end of Revelations, that second death, uh, which is uh, kind of a scary thing. But for those that hold on to Jesus, you will not be touched, you will not be hurt by second deaths. And so when we talked about in this particular letter, there was no correction by Jesus. There was no rebuke. Because when people are in deep suffering, when people are in deep persecution, what they need is for someone to come alongside them and to encourage them. And that's what Jesus did in that letter. And we talked a little bit about the persecuted church from the book that someone had written in, in interviewing the persecuted church. And I, I forwarded out an email to you kind of with all eight of those items. I don't know who all got that this week, but all eight of those items that they had found to be true about the persecuted church. And so it's important. One of the important things we talked about and we did last week was we prayed for the persecuted church. It says to pray for those who are persecuted as if you're there with them, as if you're suffering with them. And those who are in prison as if you also are in prison with them. Really try to engage and relate with them where they are. We talked about that. These were those lessons to, 
know that they that the persecuted church knows this vibrant living Jesus. It's not just a rope thing. It's not just religion. It's not a denomination. But they know a living Jesus. That they're suffering. They know that their suffering has a purpose to bring witness to Christ. They know they're not forgotten by us because we pray for them. At least 12 times a year, once a month, we spend time praying for them. And hopefully you do that on your own in your prayer time. And then lastly, we talked about how they're following in the footsteps of faithful believers who have gone before them. They have generations of of people, their mother, their grandmother, their great-grandmother, who have also experienced persecution. So they've got those spiritual muscles already worked so that they understand how to live in persecution. I pray that uh, we'll be prepared to respond in the same way when the persecution comes to us. Dave, could you turn me up just a bit, please? So today we're talking about Pergamum. And as we saw on the map, it was north of those other cities. It's about 15 miles inland, so it's not a coastal city like the other two were. The interesting thing about Pergamum is that it was a city that was built on the side of a hill. And at the top of this hill, they had what's called an Acropolis. And there were four different uh, patron deities that were all present at the top of this hill. So you have this city down below, and then you have on the top of the very top of the hill, you have these four temples. So everyone's always looking up to these huge temples that are at the top of there. About 150,000 residents. There's the city actually means Pergamum actually means citadel. So because of because of the the way it was built and where it was built. And it turns out it was the first seat of the Roman Empire in Asia. So uh, it was also a very big center of learning. They had a library with over 200,000 volumes. That's a big library, especially in the first century, right? Where there wasn't a lot of, you know, you didn't have a printing press. You could you had copy books one by one to put them in the library. Interesting story as an aside. Uh, Cleopatra's lover, Mark Antony, is that my, am I right there? Yeah. Uh, he conquered this city and he took the library and he gave it to her as a gift. <laughs> that was one of the things that uh, was about their history. But it's important as we look at this letter to remember uh, this seat of the governor. So there was a governor there who was uh, powerful. And they carried as part of their, um, the way that they judged, they had a sword that they kept. And that sword was their, uh, the way they pronounced, you know, kind of like a king would knight somebody, would, you know, had, it had authority with that, with that sword. It was a part of, of his uh, uniform or outfit. And it's how uh, he brought justice or how he made judgments. It was uh, because he carried that sword. That's important as we get ready to read. This, uh, this letter. All right, if you will, turn in your Bibles with me, if you have it, or your uh, device, or however you're looking up this, that you can follow along. We're in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through 17. And I'll be reading from the New International Version. To the angel of the church in Pergamum, write... These are the words of him who has the sharp, double-edged sword. I know where you live, where Satan has his throne. Yet you, re yet, yet, you, yet you remain true to my name. You did not renounce your faith in me, not even in the days of Antipas, my faithful witness, who was put to death in your city, where Satan lives. Nevertheless, I have a few things against you. There are some among you who hold to the teaching of Balaam, who taught Balak to entice the Israelites to sin so that they ate food sacrificed to idols, and they committed sexual immorality. Likewise, you also have those who hold to the teaching of the Nicolaitans. We've heard that name before. 
Repent, therefore, otherwise I will soon come to you and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Whoever has ears, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give some of the hidden manna. I will also give that person a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. The word of the Lord. So we've talked about the general format of these letters is that there's a characteristic of Jesus Christ that's mentioned. There's a commendation that he gives to that church. There's a complaint that he has uh, that he's not happy about. And then there's a correction that he offers what they need to do. And then he ends with a conclusion and a promise. So let's take a look at that. Our characteristic of Christ is, is that he has the sharp, double-edged sword. So we know that the sword was meant for use for justice as the governor carried his sword and that gave him the authority to do that. But we also know from other parts of the scriptures that that, that sword is the word of God. And we heard that in our invocation this morning as well, that he carries the double-edged sword and that he, is, which is the word of God. And this is from Hebrews 4. It says the word of God is alive and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword, and it penetrates even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of the heart. And I want us to remember that one of the main reasons we left the United Methodist Church was because they no longer wanted to hold the word of God into this rightful place to let it judge the thoughts and attitudes of the heart to let it divide between the soul and spirit to let it divide between the joints and the marrow you only have to have seen somebody have a dislocated shoulder and see their bone down in their chest to know it's a difficult thing when your when your joints and your marrow are split it's a painful thing. And that so the word of God can be both a painful thing and it can also be a healing thing. So I want us to hold on to that. Hold on to the one who is carrying this double-edged sword, this word of God for us today. He commends them and he says, I know where you live where Satan has his throne, yet you remain true to my name. It's a difficult thing when the whole swimming water of the culture all around us is lifting up gods of all kinds. And we're trying to hold fast to the name of Jesus. Amen? It's hard. What kind of gods do we have around us here in our culture? We have the God of wealth. We have the God of self. We have the God of the impossible to attain perfect body. Those are just three that come right off the top of my head. They had four that were in front of their face all the time and pervasive throughout their whole city. You see, anything that Satan can use to turn us from holding true to the name of Jesus, he'll do it. And it's worse when it says that his throne is there and that he lives there. He lives there. Satan is the one who is the prince of the power of the air. He's the one who sets up all these principalities and powers, who controls politicians, and controls all kinds of systems that are set up against Jesus. And then he commends them again. You did not renounce your faith in me. Even when a leader among you, I think that Antipas was a bishop, 
was put to death in your city. So he ran afoul of this governor, this magistrate, and he put him to death. But Jesus is saying, you know, I'm the one that's holding the sword, the double-edged sword. I'm the one who will bring true justice. Don't fear these, what's going on here. I, I am greater than what's going on here. Then he has a complaint against them. <clears throat> They have accepted false teachers, and these teachers are doing two things. They're saying, hey, it's okay. There's no big deal. There's no problem here. Go ahead. Eat the food that's sacrificed to idols. Don't worry about what you do with your body. It doesn't matter. Engage in all kinds of sexual morality if you want to. And here, let's show you how. We'll even teach you how to do this. We'll invite you to come with us to the temple prostitutes. We'll engage with you. We'll, we'll have an orgy together. How about that? We're going to teach you how to do it. And then the Nicolaitans, they're the ones we heard about before, where they said falsely, by the way, falsely, what you do in the body doesn't matter. What you do in your body, no big deal. It doesn't matter. Only the spirit matters. And so they also were promoting sexual immorality. And Jesus said no, no, and no to that. So what do you think that food sacrificed to idols could mean to us today? Could it be something as simple as fad diets that are trying to glorify this unattainable ideal of the physical, this glorification of the physical body? I don't know. One person I read said that this really had to do with our object, there's objective and there's subjective morality. Meaning there's some things that there just isn't written about that you have to kind of discern with your own conscience what's going to be right. And we do that based on the law of love. So if I'm with someone and they're, they struggle with alcohol, they're maybe an alcoholic, I might choose not to drink when I'm with them. Not because it's not okay to drink. It's okay to drink if your conscience is okay. But if you are with someone and it's not good for them, then out of love, you can choose to abstain. Right? You might be with someone who is a vegetarian, who may not even be a believer, who may be a very young believer and thinks that if you eat meat, you're evil, right? Not because I think eating meat's evil. I love a steak, right? But because I love that person and I don't want that person's conscience to be afflicted, I'll abstain from eating meat when I'm with that person because I love them, right? So we let love, the law of love for one another and our conscience be our guide and things that are Subjective things that the scripture doesn't say don't do this, right? But when we come to something like sexual immorality, then the scripture is very clear, very, very, very clear. It's objectively clear that any form of sex or sex act that happens outside the boundaries of a biblically defined marriage relationship, let me clarify what that is, one man, one woman, marriage. That's your biblically defined marriage relationship. That could mean fornication, that's marriage when you're, that's sex when you're not married to someone. Could mean adultery where you're married and you choose to go outside of your marriage covenant and have a sexual relationship, even if it's in your mind, all the way down to your thoughts. Like, don't fantasize about having sex with somebody who's not your wife or your husband. Pornography, where you're objectifying the other person and you've devalued them and their image made, made, being made in the image of God. Prostitution, where you're purchasing sex without a commitment or relationship. The actual Greek word here I found was very interesting. It means to sell off 
sexual immorality means to sell off. So you're basically selling off sexual purity, selling it off, or devaluing sexual purity, which includes your thought life as well. Why is sexual purity so important? I'll get to that in a minute, but I want to talk about what our culture says, but I'm going to answer that question. Our, here's what our culture says about sexual immorality, right? First of all, it just says, what's the big deal? If it feels good, do it, right? What's it? Nothing that could feel that good could be wrong, right? Our television, our movies, our magazines, they all portray having multiple partners as a normal thing. James Bond's been doing it since 1960. So what? There's, it doesn't mean anything. It's just sex. It doesn't mean anything. And this was a shocking statistic. 85% of young people today, 85%. That's more than eight out of every 10 people. That, that's something I would call pervasive. Yes, pervasive. 85% of young people today think that the institution of marriage is not necessary. And that sexual purity is something that's archaic. Hey, that's something from the past. That's not necessary. We don't need to worry about that. Do you think that this might be some place that Satan is dwelling? Some place that Satan lives? I was thinking to myself as I put this together, why? Why is sexual purity so important? What is the big deal? The big deal is because it goes to the very core of our identity and God's plan for blessing men and women through the sacredness of marriage alone. You see, that's God's plan. Yes, sir. Can I just toss in here that children are what sex is for? Procreation. Well, yes, yes. That's well, okay, yeah. It's not about pleasure. It's about, well, only. I won't say it's not about. It's, it's a both and. But children okay, the gate one, right? Exactly. So children are the are supposed to be the fruit of this relationship, right? Because what what God said in the beginning was be fruitful and multiply, right? That was the command that He gave to Adam and Eve. But the core of our identity is man and women, right? And, and God said it was not good for them to be alone. So it's community, communion. So when God creates, he says, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, let us make them male and female. All right. So what happens then when we step outside of what God has ordained in marriage is that we are offending the communion, the perfect, wonderful, interrelating communion that exists in the Godhead between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Because we are made in the image of God and the likeness of God. And can you imagine every time Satan looks at one of the creations of God, his only desire is to mar the image of the one he hates. His, that's his sole goal. And he does it through lying and stealing and destroying. He's the father of lies. And so, friends, I think we have bought in, because we're swimming in the water, to a huge lie. To a huge lie. That sexual purity is not important. But lastly, as believers, it's so important because we are now the actual dwelling place of God on earth. It used to be that the 
priests had to consecrate themselves to be able to go into the temple. And once a year for the Holy of Holies, they would tie a rope around that high priest as he went into that holiest of holy places. Because if he hadn't consecrated himself appropriately, he might die in there in the presence of the Lord. And they'd have to have, be able to pull him out with the rope. That's how important consecration of ourselves is, purification of ourselves is, because the Spirit no longer dwells in the temple in Jerusalem. The Spirit of God, my friends, dwells in you and you and you and you and you and you and, you and me. The Spirit of God, because the Bible tells us that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit lives. Us. <coughs> so it goes to the core of our identity, and as Lance reminded me, our purpose. It goes to how we're made in the image and likeness of God to share that unbroken eternal fellowship, and how the Holy Spirit dwells within us. So would, do we want to desecrate that temple of the Holy Spirit? We have a choice, friends. We Will we choose to follow the ways of the culture that are around us, that embrace sexual morality in all kinds of ways, or will we choose the way of Jesus, the way of purity in our thoughts, in our actions, in all ways? This of the, is the most mentioned of all of the waywardness of Israel. Because even when they went to follow false gods, part of it included uh, temple prostitutes, where they were uniting their body with other gods. So, you know, this is critically important to our walk with Jesus. We have a choice. We have a choice. And Jesus' word to us is repent. Therefore, and again, I'll remind you, that word repent is two things. Change your mind. Change your mind about this. Change your mind. Let the Lord, let the Holy Spirit search you. And, and find out if there's this offensive way in you and lead you in that everlasting way. Repent, therefore, change your mind and do a 180. It means like if you're heading in this direction, turn around, go the other way. Turn your eyes away from that. Do an about face. But I think that this may be so pervasive in our culture that we may all be caught in this net in some way. This may touch all of us. So Lord, have mercy on us. Free us from this wrong thinking and turn us in a way that glorifies you and exalts your temple where your Holy Spirit dwells. This is what I love about Jesus. He doesn't say to this church, otherwise I'm going to come and remove your lampstand. That's what he told the other two, wasn't it? In this church, though, he says, otherwise I will soon come to you and I'm going to fight against them with the sword of my mouth. I'm going to bring right judgment to them. And as I read this, I thought, ah, oh, our Jesus is jealous for us. He's jealous for our purity. He himself is going to come, and he's going to fight for us. He's going to fight against those false teachings, those false perspectives, those false whatever it is that pervades our situation. And guess what? On the other end of that, he's going to purify us. He told us that he will make us stand without fault or blemish before him in that day as his bride. He 
You see, Jesus sees the church. He sees us as his bride. And he longs for a full intimacy with us. Pure, prepared, and ready for that ultimate time of encountering the Lord Jesus in heaven as a church. As a church. That together we are his bride. And so he expresses here that he will not give up. He's not going to give up on this church at Pergamon. He's not going to give up on us. He wants us to be pure. And he's going to fight for us. How many of y'all want Jesus to fight for you? He's going to fight for you because guess what? He knows that we are but dust, that we can't do this on our own, that we're fallen. But he wants that deep intimacy with us. And so here's what he promises. To the one that's victorious, I'm going to give some of the hidden manna. My uh, family makes this dish called German spaghetti. And what you do is you, it takes so much time because you have to fry all kinds of bacon and you add onions and you have uh, add tomatoes and you kind of boil it all down until it's just the right texture and consistency. And then you can put it in a small container and you can freeze it and then you cook your spaghetti and you mix the two together and mm, so good, so good. One time my sister made me this special, special sauce, right? Because it takes a while to do it. So if someone makes it for you, it's just, oh. And she sent me home a small bowl of it, which I treasured. I put it in the refrigerator. A couple days later, I came home and all day long, my mouth had been watering, waiting for this special food when I got home and I when I walked in the door, my first husband had eaten all of the sauce. Just out of the jar by itself, no spaghetti, no nothing in it. And there was the empty dish sitting in the sink. Needless to say, I was not very gracious when my special food had been eaten, which he never did again, by the way. But what I want to convey is that you know what it's like when there's a special something, a special food, something that is a treat to you, something that you would be that you would look forward to and that your mouth would water for. That's what we're talking about here. Jesus has that special food, that hidden manna. Hidden means not like, it just means not yet revealed. So the manna that they received. When they, it actually, it actually means, what is it, right? They didn't know what it was. They had never, their forefathers had never eaten it. They'd never seen it before. Can you imagine that there's something so amazing taste-wise that God has for us that we've never experienced it before? That's the kind of love, that's the kind of intimacy that's here, is that he's going to find, reveal that hidden food for us to eat. And give that to us. His purified, his beautiful mind. Then the second thing. He said, I'm going to give that person, that person who has purified themselves and no longer eats the food devoted to idols, who's held themselves pure to my name, I'm going to give them a white stone with a new name written on it, known only to the one who receives it. And I don't know if you caught it in the passage I read this morning as the invocation. It said that Jesus had a name that only he himself knew. And that he had a name written on his robe and a name written on his thigh that said, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Wouldn't it be an amazingly beautiful and intimate thing to receive a white stone from Jesus? with a name written on it known only to you and Jesus. Is that intimate or what? Or what? 
you ever had your spouse or someone close to you give you a pet name that only they called you? It's like that to the nth degree. Because whatever name is written on there is going to resonate at the very depth of the core of who you are. It's going to speak out something about your identity that's beautiful to Jesus. I found this stone this week as I was walking the dogs, and I, I stuck it in my pocket, and I just kind of turned over in my mind, what would that be like to have that kind of gift from Jesus? Will everybody get one, or will it just be certain people? I mean, I was just kind of thinking about this stone. I don't know the answers to those questions. Those are just questions I was asking. But I do know that as I carried it around this week, I had a sense, a deep sense, that Jesus wants to be known by me and wants me to know him. And remembering in the, in the Hebrew, it says that Adam knew Eve. That there's, a, that there's something unique about our intimacy with Jesus that is akin to a marriage relationship, is akin to somehow involving the amazingness of, of sex. That's the intimacy. That's the intimacy that Jesus wants for us, but he wants the, us to keep ourselves pure for that day. That day that's coming. And I want to leave you with this. The picture of the bride and the bridegroom. So I heard what sounded like a great multitude, like the roar of rushing waters and loud peals of thunder. Hallelujah for our Lord God Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and be glad and give him glory. For the wedding of the Lamb has come. And his bride has made herself ready. Fine linen, bright and clean, was given to her to wear. Fine linen stands for the righteous acts of God's holy people. And the angel said to me, write this down. Blessed are those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. And he added, these are the true words of God. If you'll stand with me. Prepare for our last song. Let me pray for us. Lord, we are swimming in a culture that does not hold to the standard of your word. We live in a place where sexual immorality is rampant, where most of the youth no longer think it's necessary to form the sacred bonds of marriage. And so, Lord, we confess to you this morning our sin. We ask that you would search our hearts and know us. See if there is any hurtful way in us and lead us in the way everlasting. Whether in word or in deed or in thought, would you purify us and make us ready for the marriage supper of the Lamb. We thank you that you are willing to fight for us, that you're not willing to let us go. Help us, Lord, we need you. And we thank you for hearing our prayer and already beginning to release what we need in Jesus' name. Amen. Mm -hmm.
from Revelation 19. May we purify ourselves and receive the blessing of those who are invited to the wedding supper of the Lamb. Amen. Amen. You can form our Shalom Circle. We may have to shorten it a bit today. John and Leisha are visiting John's sister in Houston, and the letter delis have family in from out of town, so we have a little shorter group, smaller group. Got it. Got it covered right now. All right, we're good. There we go. Excellent. Shalom to you now. Shalom, our friends. May God's full mercies bless you, my friends. In all your living and through your love. Thank you. 